the first 10 verses of that chapter. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear children, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we will know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are. And who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Let's pray. Lord, we hear many things here in these few verses. We thank you for what you have said. We thank you for the fact that you have spoken. We, we pray that you will enable us to hear and understand and receive what you, what's from you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When someone comes to our door these days, we usually know why they've come to our door. Well, that sounds a little odd as I start, I know. But it seems like the doorbell used to ring a lot more often than it does now. Now it seems that if someone rings your doorbell, it's with a specific purpose. So say, for example, if my doorbell rings, uh, quite often I know that it's some delivery man that has just shown up. They drop a package and make a dash for the truck and off they're gone. So that seems to happen every day. Amazon's always coming to our house. It just does. That's how it works. So if the doorbell rings, good chance it's Amazon. But of course, uh, there are other people, too, who come to our house. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's the cable guy, and then you say you're finally here, right? Or it's somebody you've invited, somebody you've asked to come. Come on over. Let's talk. Let's eat. Let's, uh, let's watch the game. We have a definite purpose, a definite reason for saying, come on over. Or maybe it's an event. It's a birthday. It's a Christmas celebration. But people come over for a purpose. They come purposefully. Well, this passage that we read tells that Jesus came to earth purposefully. He had a reason. Well, in fact, this passage talks about two reasons why Jesus came to earth, why Jesus became one of us. Now, there are other parts of Scripture that tell us other reasons why Jesus came to the earth. But this passage shows us two reasons why. Before I go into those, a little parentheses. As I read this passage, I'm going to focus on those two things that I'm talking about. But this passage is loaded with stuff. And as a pastor, I think well, what people hear is you read through that. And as I read through that passage, one of the things that always stands out to me is just that opening verse. Look at the love that God has that has lavished upon us. That's quite a statement. God is a generous and a gracious God. So the Apostle John, when he's talking about God's love, he doesn't say God just loves us a little bit. God has this small love. But he says, look at the love that God has lavished upon us. 
That's an outstanding statement. And it's true. And it comes from God himself. Look at his love for us. It's more than we can comprehend. And I'm not talking about that this morning, but that passage mentions that. Another thing that I'm really not talking about this morning is this idea of sin in this sense. Verse 7, what's, or verse 9, what is it here? No, verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Now, that's a strong statement, and a lot of people have wrestled with that. Because just about everybody here would say that in our lives we wrestle with sin. We still sin. In fact, the Apostle John teaches that in 1 John as well. In fact, you go back to 1 John chapter 1. He says, if we claim that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and we are making God out to be a liar. We need to confess our sin. The Apostle John within this book shows us that Christians still struggle with sin. But what he's talking about is this. Your way of life, yeah, you're going to be tempted, you're going to fall, you're going to mess up, but your way of life, you don't live the way a non-Christian lives. You don't follow the prince of darkness, but you are following the sun. You will goof up along the way, you will mess up along the way, but you are followers of Jesus and you do give up on sin. You're living a different kind of life, but it's still a struggle. Now, I thought that was important because that passage talks about some of those things, and if you're listening carefully to it, maybe you wondered about those things. They're important things. But what I want to focus on this morning is what John says in verse 5 and verse 8, where he gives two reasons why Jesus became one of us. Verse 5 says this, But you know that he appeared. Jesus showed up. He came to earth, revealed himself to us so that he might take away our sins. The reason, one reason why Jesus came to planet Earth, one reason why Jesus became a human being, why Jesus became one of us, was to take away our sins. Now, who does that? Think about that for a moment. Who does that? People want to take something from us, but they want to take the good stuff from us. Jesus becomes a human being, comes to earth with a definite purpose. He wants to take something away from us. He wants to remove it from our lives. What he wants to take away is something bad. He wants to take away our sin. Now, the Apostle John doesn't tell the Christmas story. We did hear part of John chapter 1 a few minutes ago where he talks about the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But John doesn't tell us the Christmas story the way some of the other Gospels do. John doesn't tell us about Mary and Joseph and the baby. He doesn't tell us about them journeying to Bethlehem. doesn't talk about those things. He doesn't say about a stable and animals and animals that talked and all that stuff that you hear. Well, that one might be a little far, but anyway. He doesn't talk about those things. But instead, he says, the word became flesh. Jesus became a human being. And that's really all he says about the Christmas story. But he says, Jesus did this for a reason. Well, a couple reasons. But one reason was to take away our sin. Now, John wrote 1 John. And so he says that here. The reason Jesus came in the flesh was to take away our sin. If you go back to John chapter 1... Then you read about another John, a different John than wrote these, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the first one who really clearly announced, look, 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 look who's here. And how did he talk about Jesus? He said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You have to see verse 5 and you have to hear John the Baptist speaking here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The reason Jesus became flesh was because he came to this world as a human being, but he came as the Lamb of God. Now, a good Jewish person would understand some things right away when he or she heard that. Thinking that this person was the Lamb, you would think to the Old Testament, you would think of the Passover. There was the Passover Lamb. 
and the Passover lamb that had to be slain. God's wrath passed over your house if you had the blood of the lamb on it. A good Jewish person would think of the lamb, the Passover lamb. A good Jewish person would also realize that um, lambs were sacrificed. That was one of the sacrifices that were made. The lambs. The lambs were sacrificed. But a good Jewish person would also remember Scripture, would remember what Isaiah said. What does it say? Isaiah chapter 53. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is silent, so he did not open up his mouth. A good Jewish person would remember that. They would know that John is talking about something spectacular, that God is some, sending someone to take care of this problem with sin. However, I don't think anyone, perhaps even John the Baptist himself, clearly understood at this point that Jesus was literally going to be slain. We like this cozy little story about Christmas. We like it a lot. We like the story about Mary and Joseph and the baby. We like the story about them journeying to Bethlehem. We like the story of, of, of the shepherds and the angels. That's a wonderful story. It's so cozy. But the reason that Jesus was born in Bethlehem was to take away the sin of the world. He was born to become the atoning sacrifice, the sacrifice that takes care of our sin. That's one reason why Jesus was born. Now today... I think there are a lot of people who say, you know, I, I like this Christmas story. It's a, it's a nice little story. And maybe they even believe that Jesus w- was born in Bethlehem. Maybe they believe that. But, you know, why do you have to bring sin into it? Why do you have to talk about our sinfulness and needing a Savior? And there are a lot of people who just think, well, sin is kind of... Haven't we moved past that? Do we still have to talk about stuff like that? But then sometimes, sometimes we know better. There are too many times in my life when I have to say I'm sorry. You know what I mean? There are just too many times when I have to say to somebody, I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I did that. I, I, I wish that I lived more perfectly than I do, but sometimes I have to say, I'm sorry, I have to apologize because I didn't do it right, didn't handle it right. And I imagine some of you have that same experience. There's sometimes in your life you have to say you're sorry to the people you live with, work with, whatever it is. We mess up. And any human being is going to acknowledge that, I hope, but sometimes we just mess up along the way. But if that's true, if that's true that sometimes I I have to say to people, I'm sorry for what I did, now you're talking about God, who knows everything about us inside and out. How could it possibly be? How could it possibly be that sometimes we don't have to say we're sorry to him? He knows us inside and out. And he knows that we have a problem. And so he makes a solution for it. He sends Jesus to take it away. You can't get rid of it yourself. You can't solve it yourself. You can't, so to speak, heal yourself spiritually. And so I send Jesus into the world to take away your sin. Who does that? Who's willing to pay the price and do the hard part for us? God is. 
And the reason he sends his son into the world is because we have this immense problem that we can never fix ourselves. And so he sends Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. That's something. So why did Jesus come? He came to take away our sin. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. But there's a second reason this passage shows us that Jesus came. Did you catch it? Did you see it? It's, it's, it's in verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. He came to destroy the work of the devil. Now, at one time, people were very afraid of the devil. If you go back to an earlier time in, in our history, the history of the world, there were a lot of people who were scared to death of the devil. They were scared of what the devil could do to them. And they were afraid of Satan. Well, society has changed immensely. And now, even as maybe I talk about uh, the, uh, Jesus came into this world to take our sin away. And some people wonder, why do we have to have our sin taken away? There are a lot of people who think, well, when you talk about the devil, you're talking about something utterly ridiculous. Things have changed. C.S. Lewis uh, talks about some of this in several of his different books, but, but, but one of the things that he says is, is that what we have to do is we have to get rid of the devil's pitchfork and the devil's red tights and we got to see the devil for who he actually is. A lot of people snicker, laugh, think it's ridiculous to be talking about the devil. But I've also noticed that people are changing their tune. I don't think people are as rampant in denying the devil as they used to be. Because look at the world that we live in. There is evil. There is evil in this world. Now, I haven't watched it, and I'm not going to watch it, but I even see that there's a television uh, program called Evil. Have you seen, seen that advertised? Anybody? I think a couple of years ago there was one out Lucifer, wasn't there? Yeah, 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 yeah. People used to deny this, but people aren't denying it the way that they used to. Because all we have to do is look around us. And I'm not going to paint the picture and say everything is as black as it possibly can be. God created this world. This is our Father's world. He's made a magnificent world and he's created people in his own image. And we see a lot of good in this world. But we also see a lot of evil. There is both. There is goodness and there's beauty and there's wonder in this world. And on the other hand, there is darkness and there is deep darkness. And Satan is doing some incredibly terrible things. And so you take a look at this world and you see, you see evil. You know what's real. And so people used to laugh and joke, but people really aren't laughing and joking the way they used to be. It's, it's out there. We know it. But the scripture says one of the reasons why Jesus came was to destroy the work of the devil. There's a helpful passage. It's in several of the Gospels, but I think I have the Gospel of Mark up here. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. Beelzebul. I always say Beelzebub, different translations. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. And so in other words, they're watching Jesus. And Jesus has this incredible power and he's able to speak to the demons of his day, and they had to listen to him. They had to do what he said. And so when Jesus would speak to the demons and they obeyed, they say, how can he do this? We can't do that. And so what's their conclusion? It's by the prince of demons he's driving out demons. He's one of them. And so Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Now, this next verse especially depicts Jesus' ministry. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Through Jesus' ministry, which comes to the pinnacle upon a cross of all places, Jesus defeats Satan. Hasn't destroyed him yet, but he defeats Satan. So much so that the Apostle Paul says in the book of Colossians, When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. He forgave us our sins, having canceled the charge of our indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And then at the cross, he has defeated the principalities and the powers that were against us. The victory has been won. Jesus has already overcome the power of Satan himself. But at the same time, the battle still goes on. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. But that work isn't completely destroyed yet. Jesus already fought a battle. And the battle was won upon a cross of all places. As wonderful as the story of Bethlehem is, as wonderful as the story of Christmas is, It makes no sense without a cross and an empty tomb. That is why Jesus came, to defeat Satan's work. The battle has been fought, but still there's conflict. There's all kinds of conflict. And Satan is still out there. He's still the strong man. He may not be loosed totally, He might be bound partially, but he's still wreaking havoc. Satan wants to destroy. He wants to destroy everything that's good. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy me. He wants to ruin the church. He will do everything that he can to make that happen. Satan wants to ruin everything, including our lives. That's enough to make us fear. But then you remember what God has said. I have sent my son into this world to destroy the power of Satan. He has been defeated and he will be defeated. Right now, we live in a battle land. There is good. There is evil. There is the power of God. There is the power of Satan. We know who wins and we know that Jesus shall reign forever and ever. But until that day comes, remember that the story of Christmas is not a story, a cozy little story of peace and tranquility, but it's a story about a clash of kingdoms. And that clash is still taking place. But Jesus, the Lord, shall win and shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray.